this is uh, what will be my attempt at a kind of like a review. I hesitate to call it a review, but more of a view of uh, this game of Austerlitz by the Napoleonic uh, of the Napoleonic Brigade series by the Gamers. It's from 1993, and it introduces itself as the premier game in the Napoleonic Brigade series. Bought on December the 2nd, 1805, etc, etc. Now the game was designed by David Powell and the series was designed by David Powell and Dean Essig. Um, it came in two forms, a box form or like a bagged form. I got the bagged form and in it you got this uh, lovely map. Um, all the, these counters. There's more counters, you get counters for um, various markers of marching, uh, strength point losses, there's even more, I didn't use them all. So the, these are a load of unpunched, uh, these are for changing morale, I didn't bother with that because you can note morale is noted on, on the loss sheets as well. Um, so you get lost sheets, you get, what else do you get? Um, uh, series rules. This is version one. That's what the game comes with. Charts and tables. Um, the Osterlich specific rules. Um, the series rules are 36 pages long, but that includes some designer's notes. There's eight pages of tables here, but you can kind of forget about that because essentially what you want to do is get this version 3 series rules. These are downloadable off the um, gamer's website, and with them also come uh, new, somewhat different tables. Uh, so uh, four pages of them. Oh six pages of them and um, you can also download where is it I've got it in here you can download what they call them and oh sorry about all the bits Bob's Austerlitz updater so this is an update of this um, game to the series three rules there's not a lot of changes um, just two pages uh, there's some errata and uh, the loss charts were updated, but you also get a further option that wasn't available before. And uh, interestingly enough, you only get one scenario for the actual historical game in the update. I thought that was a bit of a loss, so I actually went in my game with one of the scenarios from the um, original uh, version. In this version, you get two, two battle scenarios, so I played those out before. Essentially, those are the right and left wings of each army duking it out. And you also get the historical scenario. And then you get the scenario that I took, Kutasov in command. So that gives him extra initiative. The Allies have an advantage in that their commander is not as lethargic as, I guess, was, historic, was historic in the day. He's not quite the match for Napoleon, but it gives you... Uh, it gives the Allies more of a chance in, in, in manoeuvring their, in ordering their units around. And then it also gives you a fifth scenario, the advance to battle. That's interesting because it includes a whole extra day, the day before the battle historically happened. So essentially, um, the French set up roughly on their day, the positions of the day of the battle. The Allies set up completely off board. So they, in that one, you can come on, you can do your completely own historical starting dispositions. The scenario that I chose were the historical dispositions, but essentially um, the idea you get is that Kutasov has woken up and he, he throws out the pre-decided orders from the um, Council of War the night before and gives his own orders. That's what I did. And I chose to do that because I thought the historical... Um, game would be uh, exciting in itself as a kind of like a, a what if in the sense of what if the Allies could do better than they historically did because um, you know Napoleon's going to do well unless you're a really incompetent player um, which I think I was a bit in this game with uh, the French. Um, 
the one that I chose was a bigger what if. It's what if the Allies actually had a different plan. And and uh, it worked for them in this game. Um, we ended in a draw instead of the stunning French victory as occurred historically. But this is not supposed to be about my playthrough, but about the game itself. That's just to illustrate the um, different options that you have with it. Um, uh, the game... Um, the beautiful thing about the game is, is that any uh, revision of their rules, they, they, they say that they will always be retrofitted back to prior games. And that's completely the case here. There's no problem playing with the new rules. And I suggest you do. I've played with them before and I really like them. I had a look at these series rules and um, there's, there's just sort of more in them. So essentially what I think Dave Powell did was he has streamlined everything and you get a beautiful set of rules that, that runs through really sort of quickly. Essentially what it means is that you don't have, for example, adjacent units do not fire and then move for close combat. Adjacent units essentially do nothing except if they try to sort of move around in each other's adjacency and then you suffer morale losses. Um, you can get artillery fire, of course, from point blank range. But otherwise, adjacent units are only really considered to start firing if they're going in for that uh, close assault. And so the close assault and that firing and volleys and all that is, is all dealt in one... Um, um, what do you call it? One sequence. So close combat uh, you, you, is, is covered in, in one page of tables. You have a miscellaneous morale checks and so forth at the back. You have cavalry charges, which is another page of rules because it depends, you know, is it against um, infantry or is it against cavalry? Then you get fire, which happens from between skirmishes and artillery, have their own page. Movement has its own page and then the command has its own page. And essentially that is the essence of the rules. And that is the sequence of play. Command, move, fire... Charge, close combat, and then rally. And uh, it, although there's a lot to it, and I would say that the rules are quite dense, so this game is not a beginner's game, unless you have the enthusiasm, in which case you will dive in, you, you will dig out how to play. But um, I'd say it's quite, a, the rules are quite dense, in that there is a lot in there, um, the streamlining through the charts and tables make it a beaut to play because uh, you're just not making too many rolls and checking too many tables. There's just, um, and they're all sort of quite intuitive, after, especially after a while. Let me give an example of, um, this might seem really involved, the charges, but actually it's not. Essentially, um, cavalry, they have to be in a certain range to charge, then they do the charge. Then is are they charging other cavalry or infantry? If it's other cavalry, it's a little bit different. If it's infantry, it's a little bit different. But essentially, blah blah. Um, one side or the other, or perhaps both, will check for morale, and depending on that, the charge is successful, um, or not. If the charge is successful, both sides might take losses, so they both have one die a die roll. So you roll for morale, then you roll for losses. If the charge isn't successful, the cavalry attempt to break off. That depends on morale. Do they successfully break off? Yes, they do. Then they might still take a morale loss. They're a bit shaken, a bit shook up. And a beautiful sort of, just a tiny little touch, is that the the uh, the, the charged unit rolls a die, 50-50, on an odd number, it takes a morale loss. So um, that, that can be very significant. It seems like minor. Um, okay, if the cavalry don't, succeed at breaking off then they're repulsed so they will take more than just a morale loss they'll also take some they actually tried to go in there was firing there was bayonets there was sabers so they did take some losses and uh and so they there's another role there so just a few rolls you follow you go through the sequence and it's over quite quickly the only thing that really takes time is recording the losses on the charts but that's necessary uh, um, else you have to record use strength point chits and morale chits on the board which is possible um, but you'd still have to use the charts as well because the stragglers are different from strength point losses etc etc 
So there's a bit of uh, administration there, which is really what takes up the most time, I would say. Um, likewise, with the commands, there's a, the administrative part is writing out the orders and uh, checking uh, to see when they're accepted and so forth. I won't go into the nuts and bolts of the game system because you would have got that by watching the playthroughs. And if you do want to get it, then do watch the playthroughs. The first one um, will give you, I guess, most of what you would need to get an idea within a, like an hour or so of watching it. Um, so, uh, yes, the game is streamlined. Oh yes, the thing about the break off, so cavalry might, um, they might charge, it's an unsuccessful charge, they manage to break off, and yet it could still have an effect in that, say, the unit they are charging was disorganised, which is a good chance it was too, or else why are they charging a unit unless it's from the rear or something like that? Because cavalry don't really want to charge um, good order units from the front. So say the unit was disorganised, the charge is unsuccessful, but it, the unit just gets a morale reduction, which sends it to a rout. So, and the unit still routes anyway, so the charge didn't run home, but it still like had a decent effect. So it's those like, it's just a small thing, one die roll, 50-50, and you get, it can mean, uh, it gives it can give a, a, an actual real life effect very simply. Um, okay, so uh, yes, um, so I'm kind of reviewing the system a bit for people new to it, and and I'll, afterwards I'll I'll say a few words about this game in comparison to Marengo, which is, and th another one I have from this system, and then there's also two downloadable, two small downloadable ones which I could compare it to because I have them. But basically, so the system, it's nice, it's streamlined. Um, uh, problems I have with it are, for example, line of sight. Now, this map is a bit different to the others in the series because this map works, uh, you can probably just about see from there, is that, um, uh, can we zoom in now? Okay, is that uh, each hex uh, the levels end at the edge of a hex, so you don't get contour lines running through hexes, which you do with the other games, but it doesn't affect line of sight, the line of sight rules as such. But the problem, problem I had is that what I found was from on the Pratt and Heights, okay, the fog has disappeared, but anyone at the top here, they cannot see, according to the line of sight rules, anything that's going on down in the valley. They might very occasionally get a glimpse along one hex row um, of something and then it's gone and uh, I don't know how realistic that is. I've uh, asked someone who's actually visiting um, the site uh, soon if on Board Game Geek, I he said, he's, I cheekily asked him could he have a look if possible to see what you can see from the top of the Pratt's and Heights. Um, so I was a bit unsatisfied playing the game because I wasn't sure whether it, it was realistic or not because essentially what it meant was that um, the Pratt's and Heights didn't seem to give that much of a benefit in that you're only going to get about two or three hexes of fire from your artillery on units coming up the hill. So um, And that is what essentially when they've reached the, the plateau before the one you're sitting on. So um, because... The hill, the hill's formed essentially by, let's say, if here's a more or less ground level, um, or sea level, whatever you want to call it, let's say that's the general base. Okay, maybe it's not the room, I mean, the streams, the valleys are deep in that, but okay, starting here, you've got one plateau, two, three, and then you have the top plateaus. So anybody sitting on the top plateaus, they could fire at someone on the plateau below, but two plateaus before them, which is is the majority of the climbing of the hill, they just won't be able to um, fire upon them. And uh, so you don't, maybe that is realistic, but then I ask, why are you going to sit at the top of the hill then? Why, why not sit halfway down it? Maybe that is realistic, I don't know. Uh, I should probably go and check out Google View or whatever it's called and, and see if I can look from the top of the Pratts and Heights and Sal's via the internet. I don't know if it's possible. Um, so that was a little 
irksome that I wasn't sure uh, there was nothing in the designer's notes for example saying yes this is how it was so don't be surprised that it's like that um, because the rule for what they call continuous slopes only comes into effect if say you're standing on a plateau then in your line of fire say there's two hexes in the next plateau and then the next plateau is two hexes after that and then the next is two hexes after that well that doesn't really happen because you get two hexes, then three, then two, so it breaks it all up. I don't know, maybe it's realistic, but if, if it was realistic, fair enough. But then the other side of that is it's such a headache as, a, as like, say, the attacking commander or the defending commander to say, right, what can I see from the top of the hill? And you have to work out this abstraction of the hexes and say... Okay, that row is visible, and I think really there's nothing on the map marking it. This row is a, as a commander on the land, you could look up and say, "Yep, I can see up there. I can see up there, but I can't see there because there's a hillock." Um. So if it is realistic, I think it would be helpful to have at least hints on the map, maybe little faint arrows saying, um. Down this avenue, you can see all the, way, all the way to there. Down this avenue, you can see all the way to there. Just to show you where clear avenues of sight are, because it's, it's not at all obvious looking straight at the map. And it's, at least for me, a real headache to try and work it out. And I do have a um, perspex sheet, so I could mark it on the perspex sheet once I had done that. But you don't... I mean, maybe one would consider if one was playing a pose that that's part of it. As a commander, it's your duty and it's the onus is on you to find out the lay of the land and this is the way you have to do it in a game. But, um, I don't know. For me, it, uh, that kind of working with the abstraction is a, is a pain in the butt and a big distraction from sort of working with the other part that's abstraction, which is the delight in, in fighting. <laughs> you know what I mean, manoeuvring, fighting, aha, I got you, and all that. Um, so I don't know where one could go with that, apart from my suggestion of lines. But um, I think someone else would just say, yeah, but then, you're, then it's all obvious, and there's nothing really to, to, to do, because... Uh, Napoleon knows where you can see him, so he's not going to go there, etc, etc. I don't know, I don't know. I mean, if you think that um, maybe it, it could be resolved by, say, having two photocopies of the map, and uh, one for the French player and one for the Allied, the French player has those avenues um, more or less sketched out, because one would assume that seeing as this was a his field that he had chosen, he had done some scouting, ordered some scouting of those avenues, because, and anyway, he was on the heights before, so he knew what it was like up there, and that was the plan, that they were going to draw the Allies onto the heights and then sock it to them, so you'd think he'd have, in fact, I believe that's what he said to the commanders, wasn't it? wasn't it? He said, you know, watch this Look at the ground you're standing on closely, guys, because tomorrow you'll be fighting for it. Um, you know, you'll be fighting the Allies for it. So it would be good if the French man had an idea, and maybe the Allies had less an idea because they had only just arrived. Um, but maybe at, at least some broad hints so that there was some work for them to do. Um, but not too much that makes it a drag and ends up meaning that I didn't do it. Do you know what I mean? I just kind of... Check. Oh, I think that can't be seen. I think that can't be seen. So I'll say it can't be seen. Um, what else? Yes. Um, wrecked formations. Now, uh, you get victory points for wrecking formations. In f for the French, that means core because they had a nice tidy core formation. For the Allies, that meant um, essentially brigades bung together in in ad hoc formations. At least for this battle or maybe just at this point of the war um, but what it means in terms of the system is that for example I gave the French victory points for um, destroying for wrecking 
the center uh, formation in inverted commas of the allies um, but the allies center formation is made up of two divisions and each division has its own wreckage sort of factor so my question was is the is the whole formation wrecked when one division is wrecked or does it need both divisions wrecked to be wrecked because one division was completely wrecked and uh, the other division was not touched so I had just had to make a judgment call because I couldn't find it anywhere in the rules and say um, yes that's wrecked <laughs> which um, it still wouldn't if that hadn't been the case it still wouldn't have given the win to the allies it would still have been a draw but it would be more of an allied advantage than slight French concession that we got here um, so yes but and that leads to another sort of gripe I have with the gamers because I had this problem with Marengo as well is that um, the it I'm not at all familiar with like corps and brigades and regiments and divisions and so forth. Even after about 10 years of wargaming now, it's still only beginning to sink in the order that they go in. You know, I, I uh, what, battalion, regiment, brigade, division, corps. And, you know, it changes from army to army, period to period and so forth. And that thing's kind of taken for granted in the rules for setups. So the way that the setups are written out, like one stroke C goes here, and I kind of like, what is one stroke C? And although it is, you can find it on the lost charts, etc. Um, it's it would help with just a few more words to say one C is Miloradovich's three. Um, brigades for example uh, just a few more words to clarify what those abbreviations mean would help someone like me mightily I had that same problem with Marengo um, I didn't have it with the uh, two small print and play games because they had such small orders of battle um, and uh, so yeah th then the only other sort of gripe I would have with the rules is, is their density is that there's a lot there um, but I think the third edition is is beautiful because Dave Powell has streamlined it so much um, that there is a lot there, but it's all it's all it's all clear. Um, I'm not saying it's unclear at all. I'm just saying um, you have to keep your wits about you as as you're reading through it. There's there's a lot in a in a little. Um, okay, so uh, as for Austerlitz itself, so in comparison to Marengo, obviously the situation itself is a set-piece battle rather than a kind of a fighting withdrawal and counter-attack, which you had in Marengo. So um, Marengo's map is kind of longer and thinner. It's not quite as big as this. It's, I mean, it's the same length, but, not as, but more of a rectangle than square. So it's not as big. And I find... I found the situation less interesting because essentially in Marengo it's all happening at one end of the map and then your reinforcements come on right at the far end of the map and so the middle of the map is really just used for moving up reinforcements unless the French decided to um, withdraw rapidly um, to disregard their given orders from from the beginning of the game and withdraw really rapidly and and sustain a lot of victory point losses which isn't really going to happen so I found it the map the, 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 the terrain given was not as well used as this one is like uh, here for for the Ostlitz game um, essentially you're not really going to use that because I doubt even with like the Allies coming on a day before, I don't know, maybe they could start here, um, on the streamline here, the French on the other side, and push them back there. But you're not really going to use that part of the map, but you do need this part of the map, because the Allied right comes on here. So there's definitely going to be a scrap going on there. And you do need all of this corner of the map, because a third core go on there, and the, the Allies um, can uh, attack 
a weak French line there in strength, so it could push them quite far back. You don't really need this part of the map. Can you see that? Um, you don't really need this part of the map so much, um, but it has to be that extended because you need that part. And then, so you have charts here. It could be maybe slightly smaller. I don't know, but it, it, it means that um, if you play the day before scenario, the Allies have got a lot of choices of where to set up. I, they don't have to set up on the Prats and Heights. They could set up on the plains here. Maybe this is a better place for a stand-up fight. Um, you know, so yes, there's a lot of scope in this game. And um, whichever battle you choose, um, well, if you take the historical battle or my battle, uh, or um, you're going to use the whole sweep of of the diagonal of um, uh, of of the map. So there's a, a lot going on, and, and you use a lot of it. So that's great. Um, it, if you're not looking at any other parts of the playthroughs, here's a quick look at some of the counters because people like that. Um, cannons. Um, what else I should be sort of talking to fill in and then uh, where are they we've got units for example let me give you a French line um, so there's I don't know if you can see this with the glare and everything sorry about that and I, I don't know can I focus on that can I get it to focus No, it's not doing anything, sorry. Um, so that's a line unit, and then the back has further information on it. Um, so they're nice, clear, um, they're not sort of pretty counters in the sense of uh, icons of men on them and stuff like that. You've got horses and cannons and lines, but uh, uh, the writing could be a bit bigger at parts of them. Um, the components are fine, yes, you've got all you need. Um, I think I used all the right markers in the end of my board. Oh, no, there's even more I didn't punch out, yeah. Okay, um, what else can I say? I think that's about it. I needn't ramble on ne unnecessarily, may I? Need I? So, uh, that's it from me and the game of Austerlitz. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you for watching and um, please leave comments, uh, I will definitely answer if you want to ask any questions that I haven't addressed. Um, and um, bum, 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 bum. I think that's about it and uh, please uh, also if you like this subscribe to my channel because the any encouragement I get is uh, gratefully appreciated because I like making the videos but the technical stuff is a pain. I have such problems with all that kind of thing. So any encouragement I get, likes, if you don't want to subscribe, dislikes is good. <laughs> you know, it makes me want to do better. Um, uh, a subscription would be great. Um, and that's about it. Yes, please, and comments. Tell me what you'd like to see, what, uh, if you've got any feedback for me or... Um, I'm not promising that I can live up to it because this is a very sort of ad hoc thing for me. But anyway, yes, that's enough. Uh, have a good day. Bye bye.